Tonight we are continuing in 1 Timothy chapter 1. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10, uh, the last part of this verse emphasizes um, those that would try to depart from the true teachings. And it says, as it mentions this, those that would hold to anything that is other than or contrary to sound doctrine. And sound doctrine is something that is frequently mentioned throughout the book. Sound, you know, sometimes you hear people speak of a congregation, you know, and they may say, well, is it, is it a sound congregation? Sound just simply means wholesome um, or sound words, wholesome teaching. And you can find the, the same kind of terminology in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 3, which says, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. And so, again, there is that uh, what we would call sound is actually translated in this passage as wholesome words. And it comes from the Greek, and we would derive the English word that comes from the Greek, the word that we would get in English would be hygiene. And if you looked at the... uh, the Greek transliteration, you would kind of see how we would derive that from it. We would get the English word hygiene, which simply means to be healthy or in good physical health. And from a metaphorical uh, standpoint, it is teaching that is free from error and promotes spiritual health. And really, that's the emphasis that's given here. We know that Paul has left Timothy there in Ephesus. There's problems that are in Ephesus, and Timothy needs to address those issues that are there. And so Paul is trying to encourage him to make sure that he promotes that healthy, sound teaching and stands against those that would bring something in that would be different. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 3, uh, we know the Bible even teaches that there would come a time in which some would not endure that, that wholesome teaching, that healthy teaching that comes from the Savior. It says so in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, that there would come a time in which they would not endure that sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So we know that even in the writings that we have, 1 and 2 Timothy here, that Paul mentions the fact that there was going to come a time in which people would not even uh, be willing to receive wholesome teaching, that they would rather hear something that would please them and make them feel good, uh, as he says it, that something that would tickle their ears. They would rather hear something that makes them feel good instead of teaching that maybe would correct them or guide them into all truth. And so they would rather turn away from the actual truth and be turned to something different. And he mentions fables in this passage. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and in verse 4, it says, He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, and evil surmises. In this passage, the word that is there for doting in the King James is actually what we would say is the opposite of sound. Sound is healthy, wholesome words. The opposite of that word is what? Well, it's unhealthy. And so when you go to this passage here in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 4, and it talks about those individuals that are doting um, here about questions and strives, That is actually unhealthy. Now, the ESV translates this as unhealthy craving for controversy. Unhealthy. Then, if you um, look at the word itself, um, that's the noun noun portion, but the verb or the action root from this word is something that is unhealthy. It is to be sick or ailing. Um, related to a noun verb uh, portion of that word, which is defined as physical malady or disease or illness, and ultimately would be, figuratively speaking, moral disease. So on one hand, you've got that which is healthy. On the other hand, you've got that which is unhealthy. The uh, Holman Christian Standard Version 
translates uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 4 as a sick interest in disputes and arguments over words, and the New King James Version translates it obsessed. Obsessed with disputes. So a person who has that sick interest, a morbid interest, as uh, other translations translate it, I think it's the NAS translates it as morbid interest, or a sick interest, something that is unhealthy. So you've got that comparison, that which is healthy, that which is unhealthy. And Paul is trying to tell them that they need to hold to that which is healthy. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 17, in this passage, and we can go up just a few verses, in verse 15 we know the verse, which tells us to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So he, he is encouraging them to do what? To give great diligence toward and great effort toward and to study. That's how we would bring it over. The King James translates it. So that you can appropriately handle, handle aright or correctly the truth, the word of truth, not mishandle it. And then verse 16 he says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now, wh whatever was going on, it's clear that this was a problem here. As you're reading 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, that there's an issue with them getting bogged down in some of these arguments, just ended up in arguments and not actually doing the work of the Lord. And it's possible for that kind of thing to foster in a group and to where there's all of this uh, you know, strife and so much so that they're not going to be active in kingdom work, they're just having infighting. And in verse 17, he says, And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, they've erred, uh, saying that the resurrection is past already and overflow the faith of some. So, in this passage, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 17, here we have the word, it says that it eats as a canker. And uh, the American Standard Version says, as doth a gangrene. And actually, if you look at the, the Greek word that is used there, you can kind of see how, from uh, the transliterated Greek, how we would get the English word gangrene directly from that word. And it's, it works like green, gangrene. The ESV translates 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 17. It says their talk will spread like gangrene. And uh, this is the Greek number 1044. And it pictures, for example, gangrene cancer, an eating sore, spreading corruption, and producing mortification or ultimately death. And the Amplified Translation says it will eat its way like cancer or spread like gangrene. So, you know, is this something to be aware of? I mean, is this something that is serious? Or is it something that we really shouldn't matter, you know, worry with? Is it something that you can just sweep under the rug and ignore and, and overlook? And no. Clearly, as Paul is trying to get Timothy to go to deal with in Ephesus what always has to be dealt with going in the, in the, into the future, moving forward, he's trying to get him to deal with the issue. He is aware of the fact that there are those in Ephesus that are doing this. That's why Paul's writing this. He knows this. He sent Timothy there so that he can deal with those issues and stand against those things that would cause people to have something like gangrene. Now, gangrene is no fun. Uh, you don't want it. What happens if you get it and, it, and it's not taken care of? And it, what happens to it? Does it spread? And then ultimately, what does it cause for members of the body? Death, right? Has to be removed, right? Doesn't it? Has to be what? Removed. There's. Yes, it has to be removed. Any comments? I heard some comments. I just didn't. Yes, it has to be removed. So, I mean, that's exactly what, when you have that, you've got to chop that thing off. And, and the same thing with cancer. You have people, individuals that maybe have a tumor or some type of cancer. They will try to go in if they can. And if, if, they, if it's possible, they will go in and try to remove that. 
if they can. Now, sometimes you have other types of treatments, but if it's possible to remove it, they're going to do that. Well, the point that's being made here is, even in this particular verse in 2 Timothy, you had two uh, individuals that had caused big problems. He speaks of those that were there and tells them to shun anybody else that would come along and try to cause these issues and bring wrong teaching, unhealthy teaching. And then he compares those individuals to two people he named specifically who tried to challenge the resurrection. And uh, so he, he explains this wrong teaching that these individuals brought to the people he compares that to gangrene or cancer. In this particular instance, you know, he, he mentions that resurrection, and they were saying it's already passed, and you've got Paul teaching, and it's coming in the future. <laughs> so, I mean, it's very, I mean, they were, this one, on this particular one, it was something that was really clear. It should be anyways. Why they were doing that? You know, I mean, when it seems fairly clear, they had come up with this, and they were spreading it, and that's the point. Now, any Anytime you take a doctrine that's a wrong doctrine, a false doctrine, something that's just wrong teaching, that the Bible doesn't teach, and then you're going around to try to promote it, and then other people begin to buy into it, when it's not what the Bible actually teaches, then that can spread very quickly. And then in a congregation, let's say somebody comes in and, and begins to teach exactly what these gentlemen are teaching, even today. And to say, oh, the resurrection is not something that's coming in the future, it's already passed. And what if somebody did that today? And then it started spreading. And then you've got several people that are starting to believe that. What has to happen? Should we just overlook it, or does it have to be stopped? We would, Barney Five would say, nip it in the bud. Nip it in the bud, right? <laughs> oh, Barney Five. You got to nip it in the bud. You got to stop that thing, right? Yep. 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 And certainly, you know, as... And some may be aware there's lots of different doctrines that throw out a lot of crazy things, whether it's the AD 70 theory or a Max King doctrine or some other issues that are growing in popularity even today and are being promulgated by um, weak preachers who have not studied. And so they've been misled. And uh, so you even have things like that today. And so when something like that comes up, it has to be dealt with. And uh, it's very important. And the reason it has to be dealt with is because of the context here. Um, it upsets people's faith. Uh, it says here in verse 18, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and 18, um, and overflow the faith of some. They've erred, they've taught this, and what has it done? Um, they're not looking to a future resurrection, so it's, it's actually overthrown the faith of individuals. Why? They received something that wasn't right. Wrong teaching, it's overthrown their faith, and, and that has significant and eternal consequences when we're dealing with things such as this. So you go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, and you look at verse 4 and 5. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 6, 4 and 5, he says, He is proud. And we're talking about those that are not teaching wholesome words in verse 3. And uh, he is proud, knowing nothing, doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh what? Well, when they're, when they're doing this, then that creates envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, and then he says, from such withdraw 
thyselves. And then he makes that contrast of godliness with contentment as gain. So again, you've got a big problem here where individuals' faith is being overthrown. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 18, he says um, again that their faith has come to that point. In Titus chapter 1 and in verse 11, in the midst of, of dealing with individuals that would do this, and actually in context, speaking of qualifications of elders, as he gives those qualifications, these men who are going to serve as elders, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 5, it's mentioned as bishops in Titus chapter 1 and verse 7, and it says those leaders of the flock, those shepherds, have to hold fast the faithful word that they've been taught, verse 9, that they may be able by sound doctrine, again, there's that term, again, Paul is writing to Titus, by sound doctrine, do what? They take healthy, wholesome teaching, and what do they do with it? They exhort and convince the gainsayers. Exhort, they're going to pull them along beside them and provide that correction and work to convince and the gainsayers. And then he talks about what, who are these gainsayers he talks about. He says, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. And then he says, especially those, uh, they of the circumcision. So there are even especially of the, the group we would call Judaizing teachers, those of the Jewish faith, especially in that group, whose mouths what? Must be stopped. So if we're talking about cancer and there's, there's unhealthy teaching that is coming along, it has to be stopped. And uh, shepherds are those that are looking out for wolves and sheep's clothing. Um, they're looking out for the flock. And uh, so here in this context, if that's the case, this it has to be d dealt with. You've got those leaders who have to stop. Their mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, even for, we would say, financial gain, filthy lucre's sake. Um, and then you notice he, he references a particular... Um, reference to one of the writers of the Cretans speaking of their own people and explaining their, their habits or what they were known for in Crete. And then he says in verse 13, this, is, this witness is true. Basically, he quotes a, uh, a writer that speaks about the nature of the Cretans and what they were known for and says that's true. <laughs> and then he says, by the way, rebuke them sharply. So sometimes, um, I'll, I'll be honest, people don't like that. They don't like that teaching. And probably they don't know that that's in the Bible. But the Bible teaches that if there are those that are teaching a false doctrine, those elders need to stand up and they need to deal with it. Now they need to try, number one, if they can, to try to convince and exhort. But if this is happening and there are individuals that are being led, whole households, and there are those individuals that are being deceived by that doctrine, then they have to be rebuked sharply so that they can be sound in the faith. And so um, that takes a lot of courage. It takes elders that know the Bible, that have enough knowledge, that they, they can hold fast the faithful word that they've been taught so that then they can use that teaching, those sound words, to be able to deal with those individuals. So they've got to know the Bible so that they can take the Bible and, and stop that false teaching dead in its tracks and rebuke that individual. So if there's somebody that comes along and decides they're going to stand up and preach false doctrine from the pulpit, then elders have certainly the authority and right and are commanded to deal with that. Now, they, if they think it's a mistake, they can try to go and deal with that individual, as the Bible teaches, pulling them alongside, exhorting and convincing. But if they find out, no, no, this person is absolutely teaching that, it wasn't an accident, and this is actually a wrong, unhealthy teaching, then they have every right to stand up and rebuke sharply if that person refuses to stop. Their mouths must be stopped. Why? Because they're, they're not content just holding to a belief. They're going around and trying to convert others. They're trying to push that, also that belief, onto others according to verse 11, Titus 1 and verse 11. So when that happens, then that needs to be dealt with. It's dealt with by showing the truth. Error can be exposed best when truth is presented strongly 
And so when truth is presented strongly, there's really nowhere to go. You just expose what the Bible already says. You open up the Bible. This is what the Bible teaches. This is what's right. This is what's true. And uh, then error then is exposed. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14, He says, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. And so they need to be careful that they are not spending time in useless uh, debates over certain things. Now, the, on one hand, you have the doctrine, which is something that must be held. When you're dealing with a resurrection... I mean, you can't have individuals coming along teaching the wrong doctrine of the resurrection. I mean, it's the fundamental of the gospel. First uh, Corinthians chapter 15, 1 through 4, it's the foundation of the gospel. Um, and so that has to be dealt with. Um, you might have some that would come along and uh, start arguing about genealogies, as is mentioned in 1 Timothy chapter 1, which we've read already. At the first part of it, where it de deals with those individuals that were coming along and trying to deal with endless genealogies, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 4, and that's just, that's just useless, basically. And the Jews were known for doing this and trying to go back and trace those. It's foolish, unprofitable, it's worthless. And so in Titus chapter 3, in Titus chapter 3 and verse 9, that's why we have the admonition avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. And uh, so you have some that were uh, coming in and bringing these things up and uh, trying to debate over those genealogies, and it was worthless, it was empty, it was profitless. And so what you had during this time, especially the writing of, of uh, First Timothy, is you had individuals that were following a wrong type of Judaism, and you can see that in a lot of different places. That's why in Titus chapter 1 and verse 10, he says there are those that are vain talkers and deceivers, and, and he specifically mentions those that had uh, a wrong view of Judaism, especially, he says, they of the circumcision. And in Titus chapter 1 and verse 15, I mean, excuse me, Titus chapter 1 verse 14, Titus 1 14, says, Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. And so there, there's no doubt that as Paul is writing to Timothy, he's writing to Titus, that there was some corruption of Jewish teachings and, and issues that were, they were drawing from the law that were just uh, wrong teachings. And so they were not to give heed to Jewish fables. Now, that's really interesting. Um, there's a significant pile of Jewish fables. You can go back and read the Talmud, and included in the Talmud, they have sections there where it's just Jewish fables. And I've been doing some study on Islam, and it's very similar um, that what Jews would do, and that's actually where you get a lot of things that are brought into the Quran and the Hadith and some of the other teachings in Islam. And so what happened is, uh, you know, Judaism is very old, and you had a lot of Jews there in the, t the place where Muhammad would have lived, and he picked up a lot of those teachings from the Jewish fable and actually put some of that information into the Quran and uh, placed it in there. And that's where the root of where some of those things come from. He pulled that into that. So we know that the Jews had these fables, and some of them would go back and uh, they would embellish um, these stories, even of genealogies, and uh, recorded them in uh, part of the Talmud. And it's the Haggadah, if I said that right. It's H-A-G-G-A-D-A-H. -A 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 so in, in that portion of the Talmud um, where the Jewish rabbinical writings are, and they had a lot of rabbinical myths and legends, and they would embellish those. And it, you know, you can go back and find some of those even in some of the apocryphal writings and the pseudo-apocryphal writings, for example, in the, the Book of Jubilees, and, which is grouped along with the pseudo-apocrypha. 
and a lot of the other writings. And so what they were doing is they would go and they would embellish all of these. Sometimes they would go back and they would pick different characters and they would uh, attribute to some of the patriarchs, maybe wives, and then they would start trying to come up with these genealogies and they would have all of this and they would write. Um, and uh, it's interesting. It's something like what a bunch of people would be sitting around a campfire, a bunch of Christians and just joking around and talking and then starting to make up stories and all of a sudden you'd pretend somebody's over there writing them down and then you can imagine hundreds of years later people are saying, ah, oh, that's right. You know, but it was just stories that they had a lot passed down um, as these rabbinical myths or legends were passed down in Judaism, but they were not and never have been a part of the canon of Old Testament inspired scriptures. They were never even accepted by the Jews. And that's why it's in the separate, the traditions of the Talmud. It's not included in the Judaistic canon of the Old Testament. They're not there. They never did include them and did not believe that they were on the same footing as what we have in our Old Testament. And so why would they do this? Uh, why would they want to establish Jewish religious traditions? Or did they? Well, they did. I mean, why would they have all of these genealogies and tell all these stories? And why would he? Why would Paul have to write Timothy and say, Timothy, you've got to stop this from happening? Because what's happening is you've got these Jews and they're sitting around telling all these stories. But that's not, that's not accurate. That's not actually what the Bible teaches regarding these things. And you've got to stop this because they're sitting around saying stuff that is empty, it's meaningless, it's made up, it's fabricated. And everybody's focusing all their time about talking about these made-up myths and stories when they're overlooking actually what is true and inspired by God, and they're wasting their time. And then they start arguing about those things. And uh, so he was trying to get them to, instead of reading into passages, which is eisegesis, he wanted them to exegete passages, which is to draw out the meaning of what is already there. But what they were trying to do is to read into passages and place into their many of their Jewish traditions. Jews were known for following traditions and binding it uh, frequently. We know that even from the New Testament writings. And so he basically says this is a waste of time. It's uh, fruitless discussions and engendered fruitless discussions among them when they should be trying to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ instead of wasting their time arguing over these things. And so we know, according to 1 Timothy chapter 4, that there was our, you know, there, that we know that there was going to come a time in which there was going to be a departure from truth, that there was going to be an apostasy. A matter of fact, as Paul is writing to Timothy, he tells him that. And so it's not like a surprise that there would be those that would eventually depart from what is truth. It's prophesied. Right here in the Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 through 5. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that is very clearly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. I mean, this is a, a prophecy. This is what's going to happen. So it's not a shock to say, well, I don't understand why people departed from the true faith. Well, here is a prophecy that it was going to happen before it, it, it had officially happened. There were those moving that direction, and they're trying to keep them from doing that. But he says, there are going to be those that do this, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devil. Those are not teachings that are held Satan. Satan is trying to deceive many. And it says in verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy. Those that would come along and bring these teachings to pull people away are doing what? They're, they're not actually sincerely following the faith. They're living lies of hypocrisy, and they're speaking lies trying to draw people away from it. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And then he even mentions some of these strange doctrines. As a matter of fact, when you're reading 1 Timothy chapter 1, and, and, and even in 1 Timothy, he talks about strange doctrines. What strange doctrines? Well, this is one. Forbidding to marry. That's a strange doctrine. He said that's going to happen. Did it happen? Yeah, we know that. Um, there have been religious groups that have done that. We know that it happened pretty early on, but also even in you know, religious history today, we're aware of Catholicism as forbidding to marry, um, specifically. But here in this case, he says, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. 
There would be those that would try to say and forbid certain kinds of meats. And now under the New Testament, that was not something that was binding. Under the New, under the New Testament, they were at liberty to eat. Whereas in Judaism, as part of the Old Testament law, they were forbidden to eat pork and many other animals, by the way, that are listed there that they were not to, to eat. Um, to eat, but in this case, now they are free. And so, in this passage, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it received with thanksgiving. So, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verses 1 through 5, he says, No, this, no, also. This, no, also. That in the perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, in continent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. So we can see that this is, this is a, a real serious thing. It even mentions in verse 6 how some would be led captive um, and, and turning individuals away from the truth. And you continue to move down, um, and it speaks in verse 8, those of corrupt minds. And you know, so you, you can read on, and on, even in the context, how are those that are, are coming along and trying to draw people away. And so we know that apostasy was going to come. And uh, you see in uh, verse 6, this is already happening. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Um, and now, as these two mentioned here, um, so do these also. So he gives an example. And he's saying there are individuals that even now are following the pattern of those in the past who have not been holding to the truth, and they need to be careful and need to be aware of that. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 3, as we've stated already, there are going to be those that would try to come up with these strange, weird doctrines you know, it's interesting when you think about some of these weird teachings that they brought along. Um, we can see even echoes of some of Gnosticism that would be coming along that he's dealing with even in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy as he's having to try to address some of those issues. For example, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 18, we mentioned it already, whosoever concerning the truth have erred. Um, trying to overthrow the faith, and there were those that were trying to do it. And we know this to be true, dealing with the resurrection in Acts chapter 23, going back to the book of history. Um, and so we look at the historical accounts in, in the book of Acts. And in Acts chapter 23, and uh, we can start with verse 6, but when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees, other part Pharisees, he cried out the councilmen and brethren, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Of the hope of the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. And when he had said so, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided, for the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. And so we know even there were, was a division even among the Jews regarding the resurrection but some had gone even further and uh, because the Sadducees would say there is no resurrection. There are others that would say, well, the resurrection is past. And so we can see there is all different flavors of individuals trying to challenge the teachings of the truth, especially regarding the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, you know, Gnosticism has been a problem in the first century in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And in verse 20, he says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings, opposition of science, uh, falsely so called. 
And so when we read through all of these different passages, we know in the, the Colossian heresy that often we reference that was dealt with in the book of Colossians, in Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 8, uh, we can read a little bit about that, uh, though we've gone in depth previously about it. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, he says, Beware lest any spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. And we know that many had come along, even going down to verse 18 and all the way to the end of the chapter, those that would beguile you um, and dealing with the worshiping of angels and dealing with some of the issues that they would teach regarding the deity of Christ, whether He has come in the flesh. And um, he would deal with that, especially in the latter part of Colossians chapter 2. We know 1 John chapter 4 deals with it, and so that's another heresy that he's having to deal with. So as you think about why, why, would, why would Timothy, I mean, Paul have to write to Timothy and Titus and say, now you need to be aware and you need to stand up against these individuals, and you need to stand strong, and you don't need to let people come in and try to, to divide. He's dealing with a lot of different things. He's got Judaism, people trying to divide over that. People trying to bind circumcision, according to Acts chapter 15. People trying to come in and draw them back to the old law. There were those that were trying to bring in Gnosticism to try to say that the flesh is evil, and that there's no way that Jesus came in the flesh, or maybe try to deal with some form of that, and so in 1 John chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 3, that's why he would write, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So why is Paul having to tell Timothy these things? Well, here's the reason. No, uh, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that co confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. But every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. So even when we have this writing here, that John is writing, already when he writes this, this spirit that is against Christ, that's Antichrist, against Christ, has come into the world saying that Jesus didn't come in the flesh. And he said, there, those individuals that bring that, they're false prophets, and you need to try them. You need to test what it is that they're saying. 2 John uh, verse 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an anti-Christ. Who? Well, it's not just talking about one person. This is talking about anybody that comes along and says, you know what, Jesus Christ didn't come in the flesh. Well, that's a, that's a part of what the Gnostic belief was. It's not the only part of it. They felt like they had special, uh, special knowledge. But a part of that Gnosticism was the teaching that the, the flesh was evil. And we know, according to John chapter 1 and verse 14, the Gospel of John, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. We know that Jesus came in the flesh. So going back to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 3, we know that there was going to time, come a time in which some would not endure that sound doctrine. And because of that, that's why Timothy, I mean, was told by Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2 to do what? Preach the Word. Preach the Word. Whether they like it, whether they don't. That's in season, that's out of season. It's in season, it's not. It's out of season, it's not so good. Whether it's in season, out of season, whether people like it, whether they don't like it, you preach the word, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. There is the long suffering, the continuation, to continue to suffer along with them, to present the doctrine, but there are there are words in that text that most people don't like when it comes to preachers. They Generally, even according to this text, like preachers that tickle their ears and don't, don't stand up and say you're doing wrong, you need to change. But the Bible says if you're a preacher, then you're going to do that. That's going to be a part of your preaching. When you preach the whole counsel of God, it's going to include reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And so he was told to do so. 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, and in verse 13. 
who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. So Paul um, acknowledges where he has come from, and that even in his past, this is where he was, but now he is no longer. He has made that change. So any teaching that adds to God's Word, for example, in this passage that we've been talking about, and some of the things that he has to stand against, it's talked about myths. Some have turned aside, verse 6 of 1 Timothy chapter 1. They've turned aside to vain jangling. Um, and you know they're, they're, they're bringing all of these genealogies. They're bringing fables. They're, they're bringing all these things in. If people try to add to God's Word, whether it be with myths, myths or whatever, then it's, it's to be rejected. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, 6 through 9. It's to be rejected, and that person is to curse and anathema. And so it's unhealthy. That's not sound. That's unhealthy. If a person takes away from God's Word, you know, we can't add to or take away. If a person takes away from God's Word by saying the resurrection is already passed, then that's not healthy teaching. That's not right. That's not sound teaching. It is to be rejected. If a person diverts attention away from God's plan of salvation and starts teaching strange doctrine or strange doctrines that are mentioned, um, even in this book, uh, in chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, as he talks about those strange teachings, then that person or that teaching is to be rejected. And it is not something that is sound. It is not something that's wholesome. So false teaching had to be stopped. It is not overlooked. It is not ignored. It is dealt with. Is this second bell? All right. We've been flying. Uh, we're going to pick up in verse 5 and move forward verse by verse. But what we have been doing up until this point is we've been showing exactly all over these writings that these writings are peppered with the admonition and why they are peppered with these admonitions and what was actually there and what this serves as as a background as we move forward and discuss these things. Thank you so much for your time. Good evening. Open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, and that's going to be our text as we have our devotional thought. I've been spending some time uh, reading through the book uh, Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Um, I had read it in the past, but I'm, I'm going back through it again. Um, just out of curiosity, if anybody in the audience read it, just raise your hand. Okay. Um, to my understanding, I, I don't think Lee was a member of the church, but he is an individual who writes um, from a journalistic standpoint. And uh, it's interesting as he talks about his, his discovery, trying to dig in and to find the details of Christianity, of Christ, and him just going through and asking some very serious questions as he's trying to dig through and to understand better and to be a non-biased individual as he asks a lot of questions. And so, I, you know, I've really been enjoying that. And so I've started reading also the Gospel of Luke, and uh, there's just so much beauty that's here in the Gospel of Luke. We know that we have the Synoptic Gospels, and Luke tells us that he acknowledges that there, there's been other writings. And he's aware of that, but if you read here in, in verse 1, he says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. So Luke acknowledges, I, I realize that there are others that have written uh, these gospel accounts that acknowledge those individuals that were eyewitnesses of it, but he also wants to set down and in order and write down uh, this information that he has, not only of what he knows, but also what has been delivered from other eyewitnesses and reported unto him as he writes. Now Luke is unique. You know, it gives a significant amount of information about the birth of our Lord. Um, that maybe is not recorded in other places. 
But as you read through, it's fascinating to understand what exactly is being declared in chapter 1. There's a lot of verses in chapter 1, 80 verses. It's a long chapter. But in chapter 1, as he begins to paint that picture of the one that would come to prepare the way, he introduces to us the parents of John the Immerser. We call him John the Baptizer. And he introduces the parents and explains how they found out about what was coming and what John was going to be able to do as he was going to prepare the way for the Lord. Now, who was he preparing the way for? He was preparing the way for Jesus. But yet, when you read the, the passage and the fulfillment of these prophecies, it's saying, and by the way, John's going to come. He's going to come with power like Elias, who Malachi, the Old Testament prophet, prophesied would come. That John was going to fulfill those things and he was going to prepare the way, not just for some man. He was going to prepare the way for the Lord. And that makes a big difference as Jesus is introduced and we read about his birth. It's a unique birth, a virgin birth. But as you read through here, there's so much that's packed in here in the, in the middle of all these small details that are recorded by Luke this physician. In verse 4, he says that thou mayest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Luke says, I'm going to write this to you. And I know that you've been instructed about these things. And maybe even you've heard about these things. I am writing you personally to make sure that you know this is absolutely factual. This is true. And then he says, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias. And as he explains this family tree with Zacharias, and then you've got Elizabeth in verse 6, they're both righteous, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord blameless. These are good, good Jews. I mean, they are walking according to God's law, the law of Moses, Ten Commandments, they're walking in it. And, the, and, and here they're, ex, they're described as individuals that are both of them righteous before God. In verse 7, that they didn't have a child. Elizabeth couldn't have one. She was barren. And they were old. And so it came to pass while Zacharias, as a priest, as a Jew, was in the temple and he's burning incense as a part of what his role was to play according to the law of Moses and according to his tribe. He was there. He was in the temple. He's burning incense. And it says that the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at this time. And while this happened, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of this altar of incense and when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled. He was afraid. He was, I'm sure, very scared. In verse 13, the angel spoke to him, told him not to fear, and spoke to Zacharias, saying that his prayer had been heard and that his wife would bear a son to him and then even gave the name of the son. This angel said, you're going to call that son John. In verse 14, Thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Not only is it a big thing that you've got this, this barren woman that's about to have a child, and not only is it a big thing that an angel of the Lord has appeared to this man as he's serving in the temple of Almighty God, but on top of that, He's giving him this glad tidings that not only at the, the birth of this child is Elizabeth and Zacharias going to be happy about this thing, but it says there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be excited about this kid being born. In verse 15, For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, shall drink ni neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. Now that, that says that this kid is different. This, this child is different. He, he's special. Why? Because even at his birth, aside from how he will live, 
from his mother's womb, he's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now that's amazing. And then in verse 16, And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Can you think of a greater thing to be said of a person? I mean, really? You know, and now you've got this angel saying, and by the way, your child, everybody's going to be excited about him being born. And not only that, he's going to live an amazing life. And matter of fact, God's Holy Ghost has already filled him. And when he's born, he's going to come out with that, that Holy Spirit, that Holy Ghost. He's going to be filled with that Holy Spirit. And then also, he's going to turn the corrupt people of Israel, many of them, back to the Lord. And then in verse 17, as we stated already, he's going to come and fulfill the prophecies that have been mentioned of Malachi. And it says, He shall come in the spirit and the power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I think this is fascinating. We often speak of Jesus, and rightfully so, because He is the Savior. He is the Lamb of God. But think of how significant the One that came that prepared the way and how important this is and how all of these prophecies are coming in line and what John is there to do. That John is there to try to bring those Jews and prepare them for the coming of who? The Lord. He's speaking of Jesus. Zacharias, how are we going to know? I mean, I'm old. My wife's old. How are we going to know that? I mean, how can we know this? Zacharias couldn't speak anymore. He was made dumb. He was not, he was not able to speak anymore. Uh, the angel Gabriel in verse 19 uh, said, because you didn't believe what I told you, verse 20, you're not going to be able to speak until this is fulfilled in its time. And the people were outside waiting for him and they couldn't believe he was taking so long in the temple. And in verse 22, he came out, he couldn't speak. But they, they thought well, he must have had some type of vision while he was in the temple. And he beckoned unto them and remained without any words. He was speechless and couldn't speak. And then as we learn, when he finished his service in the temple, he went back to his house. And then in verse 24, after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. She hid it um, for a long time. Five months saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein He looked on me to take away my reproach among men. She was excited about this fact. In verse 26, then we read the angel Gabriel in the sixth month going to have a discussion with someone else. Joseph, there where we have the discussion that will take place in Mary. So it's interesting that as you read this up until this point and you see how amazing this is and what John was going to be able to accomplish and how significant his role was as he was going to try to prepare the Jewish nation for the Messiah, for the Savior, for the Chosen One of God, for the Lord. If ever there was information in the Bible that points to the deity of Jesus and just how significant Jesus is, you just have to go look at John. Look at the prophecies. Look at what is spoken right here. And that shows us that John was preparing the way not just for a man, but for the Savior, for the Lord. If you've not given your life to that Lord, the Savior Jesus Christ, you can do that tonight. Will you believe that He is the divine Son of God? Will you confess that with your lips? Will you turn away from your past of rebellion to serve Him? Will you submit to His command to be baptized so that your sins can be washed away? Acts twenty two sixteen. And If you need to return to the Savior for whatever reason, if you've departed from the true path, the path of light, 1 John chapter 1, 6 through 10, and you need to come home, you can do so. We have an invitation song is prepared. Won't you come? Together we stand and sing.